Okay, thank you, Duzer. Uh, well, let me just uh, welcome you all for this uh, third day of our workshop on open quantum dynamics and thermodynamics. Today, the first talk will be given by uh, Armen Alavardian from Alikhanian National Lab, Armenia. He is going to talk about work extraction from fluid flow, the analog of kernel efficiency. So, Armen, floor is not. Yes, so thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm very happy that this workshop eventually took place despite of all difficulties. So the subject of my talk is not so much quantum. The major question is uh, how much work you can extract from fluid flow. Uh, I hope you, you see my, uh, this, this moving thing. So this is the main question I will be discussing today, but I will start with some introduction which makes relations with quantum thermodynamics. And this is basically my way of reaching this, this, this type of questions from quantum thermodynamics. And then there will come the main subject and the details can be looked up from here. Okay, so this slide is discussing the, the motivation for um, doing this research. So uh, let me briefly remind you uh, something you know very well, namely what is the standard setup in quantum thermodynamics. So we had already several talks during this conference which would discuss in, in, in details this, this standard setup. But just to remind you, so there is normally a finite level system which is interacting with work source and thermal bar. So the, the main thing here is that the, this, this quantum system is doing finite motion. It's either just finite Hilbert space, finite level system, or if it is harmonic or unharmonic oscillator, then it is bound by confining potential. So the, the motions are always finite. And uh, then we couple with work source and, and buff. So, uh, and what we always do, we always compare with classical dynamics. This is also, type of our everyday business in, in, in quantum thermodynamics, we keep on, com on, on comparing with classical thermodynamics, which is kind of uh, uh, kind of the, the, the major benchmark for, for, for our research. Now, uh, there, is, there is another chapter in, in quantum mechanics. This is scattering. So scattering is infinite motion. There is, beam of particles coming from the left and going to the right. And in, in, this motion takes place in, in just infinite domain. And there are also various interesting questions here concerning energy exchanges. For instance, if a beam of particles is falling onto a external potential, then you can think about extracting some work from, from, from the beam. Or if there are two beams just colliding with each other, then they would exchange some energy. And there is also rest restitution phenomenon by which say uh, energy goes from more coarse graining to, to fr from less coarse grain to more coarse grain degrees of freedom. So there are various interesting questions here related to energy exchange. But uh, the, the main thing is that we don't know with, with what to, co to compare with. In the usual setup of quantum thermodynamics, we knew that we have to compare with classical thermodynamics. But what to do here with this type of question? Now, uh, I guess we have to compare with, with hydrodynamics, which is really thermodynamics of moving medium. So uh, hydrodynamics just combines, it merges thermodynamics, equilibrium thermodynamics with Newtonian mechanics. And it becomes such an interesting theory, which provides a classical limit for all this type of questions you can ask. So the first thing we need to do, we need to understand uh, what does it mean, work extraction in, in hydrodynamics. And once we are done with, uh, with understanding these classical questions, we may perhaps start also defining and <clears throat> studying uh, various energy exchange processes in and during scattering. So, and this is, this will be the main subject of, of, of my talk today. 
Oh, I would like to sorry. understand how to extract work from hydrodynamic flow. Sorry, now, uh, Armin. Uh, yeah. Armin, sorry, can I have a quick question here, please? Yes, sure. So when you're thinking about the scattering phenomena, are you uh, somehow not considering, because you could use things like Green's function to understand scattering and then consequently build a thermodynamic theory based on Green's function, for example. Uh, are you not looking to these limits? You're just looking at the continuum. Is that the main message that I should take from, from you? Uh, well, um, so there are, uh, there are two types of scattering theories, right? Uh, the coarse grained one is, is a stationary scattering where you have some analog of continuous media, right? And then you can, have, you, you can have single particle scattering, which is already time dependent scattering. That's right. Right? So yes. um, it depends on whether you are taking a more coarse grained perspective or less coarse grained perspective. So yeah, that's, that's how I see it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay so uh, let us... Um, Okay, so let us take a more, uh, say, um, global viewpoint. So what we are doing in quantum thermodynamics, we are following the, the road of industrial revolution. So industrial revolution pushed over heat engines. They became the dominant tool of work extraction. And they are still uh, the dominant tool for the work ex extraction. And then in quantum thermodynamics, we are just following the, the road of this industrial revolution. We are miniature, mini, minimizing or making small scale heat engines and studying various details. But there are uh, more ancient uh, tools of work extraction. Those are wind engines or windmills. They are much older than uh, heat engines. For example, this nice picture of windmill is from medieval times. And uh, nowadays there are also, as you very well know, modern wind engines, which are getting more and more useful. So uh, the question I'm discussing has a obvious practical relevance. It relates to uh, efficiency of wind engines, which we would study via uh, hydrodynamics. And then if we are done with these questions, we can, we, if we understand them very well, we can also start to quantize them and, and go with with this wind, wind engines to, to, to the quantum domain. Okay, so the, the rest of my talk will be about hydrodynamics. I understand that you may not remember it very well because hydrodynamics is, is, is normally not a, not a standard part of education of our physics students, for instance. So you may not... Uh, recall it very well, but that's not a, not a problem. The main tool will be about uh, conservation laws of, of hydrodynamics, which do admit some clear intuition. So I hope even if you don't know the core of hydrodynamics, you will still be able to follow to this, to this talk. Okay, so we are done with, uh, with the introduction and let me now go on. So this is the more or less the experimental situation with uh, with um, wind engines or with work extraction from fluid flow. There is a working body here, which I will be modeling via an external force. It's kind of propeller or some other type of device. So wind is coming from the left and leaving from from the right, and uh, this this specific shape of of, of flow lines. Flow lines means that you can, you can imagine small particles, uh, tracers, which flow in the fluid and they will just make these trajectories. So the, the experimental situation with these flow lines is more or less like this. There is, there is such a tube which, uh, which is wider in the right, right hand side. Okay, so, uh, this, this flow lines define control volume. And the idea is that you first define carefully and clearly what is the control volume. And then you apply conservation laws to this control volume. 
hoping to get uh, some understanding on how much work you can extract. Okay, so I will now schematize this, this experimental situation in such a definition of controlled volume. And let me give more details here. Okay, so uh, this red domain is where the external force is, is localized. Oh, sorry. External force is, is what your propeller is or a similar device. Now, um, these are flow lines. And I assume that the flow is stationary and dissipationless, but compressible. So let me tell a little bit what these terms mean. So dissipationless means that I'm neglecting viscosity and friction and heat conductivity. So I'm treating ideal liquid, ideal flow. Why is that? Because if I want to understand the maximum efficiency or the maximum work, then I normally expect that adding dissipation will only make these quantities worse. So as a first attempt, I should always look at dissipationless situation. Then it will be about the, the maximum work and maximum efficiency. However, uh, there is compressibility and compressibility should always be there. I should never assume in such questions incompressible flow. Even if compressibility is small, it has to be retained. Compressibility means that I allow my mass density to change. Now, what is very important with compressibility is that it, it is the merger between thermodynamics and mechanics. Namely, it, it is what makes hydrodynamics also a thermodynamic theory. So compressibility is really important. If you kick it out, then uh, you get no consistent way of understanding these questions of maximum work, of maximum work extraction. Uh, while dissipation, you can neglect, hoping that you add it one day and you see things getting worse. Okay, so on stationary means that uh, there is just a time independent flow, time independent flow from the left to the right. Okay, so propeller is modeled via external force. Now, what hydrodynamics is telling me? It tells me that there are space dependent fields, mass density, rho, pressure, and then uh, velocity. So I'm working in so-called earlier picture which means that um, stationary, in this picture, stationarity means that these quantities are time independent, though, of course, liquid particles or flow particles are moving, but, this, but these quantities are time independent. This is the concept of stationarity in hydrodynamics. Okay, so omega, this red domain, is a, is a place where my force is localized, and now, uh, how, how to choose this control volume? Well, control volume is chosen to be a minimal volume that encircles omega and allows me to calculate the total work. So the total work is given by this mechanical expression. You will see that this is a reasonable definition for the total work. Next slide will make that clear. So it's a force time velocity and integrated over the whole volume where the force is not zero. And the control volume should be such that it encircles the omega such that you can calculate the work also via the control volume B. But then also you should choose among various control volumes the minimal B. And once the choice of B is done, AX is the cross section of B. So the picture suggests that this is cylindrically symmetric, but it need not be cylindrically symmetric. Anyway, AX is a cross-section of B, small a is area of this cross-section. Cross and what I will now be doing, I will take this control volume B and apply to it conservation laws. Now let us see a few, few more assumptions about the, the flow because it appears to be impossible to work with hydrodynamic systems if you don't make certain experimental assumptions. This is what distinguishes hydrodynamics, say, from quantum mechanics. Armin, quantum mechanics, 
Yeah. Sorry, yeah. there's a question from Jumra. Jumra, yes, I'm sorry. Please, please. Yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, so in the previous slide, uh, yes. you said that this propeller is acting like uh, some stationary uh, force. And right. I couldn't understand like the physical picture, like how it gives this constant force to this fluid. Uh, so yeah, can well, you explain uh, this? Yeah. Uh, uh, apparently propeller is eventually is extracting energy from the flow, right? So mm -hmm. um, at some at some level, you can model it like an external force acting on the on the flow. Uh, but it's it... like in mechanics. If you if if say uh, if say you you try to extract work from a, from from a moving ball, you put your hand there, right? Mm -hmm. So the ball is getting uh, the ball starts to move with less speed, and your hand from the viewpoint of that ball, your hand is. Can be viewed as an external force, but isn't it dependent? Is another, oh, sorry. Yeah, isn't it dependent on the velocity, the like force? No, external yeah. force is just uh, coordinate dependent. It doesn't depend on the velocity because it it uh, it it doesn't know with which velocity the particle will come. So normally in mechanics, forces are just coordinate dependent. What you can question is whether you whether I I was allowed to assume that this force is time independent because pro, pro, propeller is moving, isn't it? So uh, yes, the fact that I assume this force to be time independent is type of approximation related to very fast moving propeller. If it if it moves fast, then you can average out this fast motion and model it via an external force. Basically, this 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 external force part is 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 a mechanical concept. Okay, thank you. Yes, you are okay. Okay, so uh, uh, what is different between hydrodynamics and quantum mechanics? So normally, quantum mechanics, you can you just uh, uh, write down your Schrodinger equation or your master equation, and then you you go on with solving it. Now, uh, in hydrodynamics, even if you think you have written down the problem, you, you cannot avoid doing experimental assumptions about the flow because this is an infinite the dimensional system. It's, it's normally very difficult to solve. So at some point you have to make assumptions which are verified, not theoretically, but just from, from experiments. Now, uh, let me now mention those assumptions and tell which are reasonable ones and which are the experimental ones. So it is reasonable to assume that this input flow is homogeneous, right? So what, the, what does it mean homogeneous? It, it means that the, that the input velocity at this A1 cross section, the input velocity is just contains X coordinate with some constant V1. And the pressure is also constant and the density is also constant. So this is, it's very reasonable to assume that I'm, I do have at infinity a homogeneous flow. Now the output flow will not be homogeneous, but I still assume that the X component of the output flow is con constant. So this, this thing is well known in hydrodynamic ex ex experiment, it's called plug flow. And to some extent it was verified experimentally. So this is what the picture shows you. X component of the output flow is also constant. I mean, it, it, is, it doesn't vary on, on this cross section. Okay, so this is, this is an assumption I have to make, otherwise no results are possible to find. Now, uh, another assumption is that my fluid is an ideal gas. So I already assumed that I neglected viscosity and heat conductivity and friction. And now I, I'm assuming that particles which make my fluid thermodynamically behave as an ideal gas. So what does it mean? It means that the entropy density is just as usual ideal gas loss. So this is, this is the expression for the entropy density as a function of pressure and density. This is an internal energy, right? It, it depends on pressure and density as well. 
And this gamma is uh, the ratio of heat capacities, which is, as you all know, they are constant for, for uh, ideal gas and thermodynamic bounds this gamma to be larger than one. And for air, it is this number. And I can tell you that uh, I have some partial results about non-ideal gases, but this talk will be mostly about this ideal gas situation. Okay, so uh, we are done with, with assumptions. Now let us discuss conservation laws. Now, first of all, let me remind you what this equation of motion is telling. It's called Euler equation of motion. It's very similar to the Newton equation. Instead of mass, you get rho. Instead of the acceleration, you get the total derivative of velocity. Now, even if the velocity is stationary, this total derivative is non-zero, as you may know. And the pressure plays the role of potential energy. So a quick way to explain what pressure is doing in hydrodynamics is to tell that it is type of self-consistent potential energy. You see, it is, it is entering like potential energy would do. And F is an external force. So nabla is, is, is the gradient vector. Okay, now you have conservation of mass. It is very um, usual form. It just tells you the divergence of mass current is zero and mass current is just rho times V of course. Now, uh, something also closely related is conservation of entropy. Again, it's telling that the entropy current is divergence is, is divergence is zero. Now, uh, why the entropy is conserved? Because I shouldn't frictionless and visco viscous-less uh, liquid flow. Now, uh, the, the conservation of energy is also quite logical. Here I have current of kinetic energy. You see it is rho v squared v. Here I have uh, internal energy density, which is rho times epsilon. Epsilon was the energy density. And here I have pressure, again, coming as if it is a potential energy. So if you, if you remind again that pressure is a potential energy, then this, this term is not surprising. And epsilon pl plus P divided over rho, they together are called enthalpy. This is just a name. You may remember enthalpy from, from, from ordinary thermodynamics. But uh, a better interpretation is to tell that Enthalpy is nothing but internal energy plus pressure, which plays the role of potential energy. And of course, the energy would be conserved as well, if not this external force, which is doing work on it, right? So this energy conservation, it contains the work part. And if I will now integrate, then I will get work which is done on my fluid. Okay, I will integrate on the next slide, but in this slide, I should continue. And I should again remind that um, I assumed homogeneous input flow, but the output flow cannot be generally speaking homogeneous. So if it is not homogeneous, then I would define normalized pressure in the final cross section, which is this P tilde and normalized density. So normalization of these quantities make look like them, uh, they start to look like probability densities. And this appears to be very useful as you will see. Okay, so this slide just reminds you the basic conservation laws. And now I will be doing nothing but carefully applying this conservation laws to the control volume B. Now, uh, there is some algebra there. Let me assume I have done it. This is the expression for the work. So it is not just work, it's dimensionless work. So let us, let us look at this dimensionless work. It is integral over uh, V times force. So from just your mechanical intuition, you could agree that this is work. Now the minus sign is put because I want the work to be positive. So, so for me, work extraction, namely the good thing, means that the work is positive. Okay, now I divided it over this quantity, which is the inflow of kinetic energy. 
if you look at this small picture, you could convince yourself that this, this quantity where A1 is an area of the input cross section, this quantity is just the influx of kinetic energy to the, to the system, you can say, right? So dimensionless work is work divided by the influx of kinetic energy. Now, uh, this A2 with, with bars and V2 is just input to output relations. So A2 is the output cross section, V2 is the output velocity, and V1 is input velocity. So uh, these dimensionless objects are very important in hydrodynamics, so they also appear here. Now, uh, what is this M1? It is the Mach number. Probably you heard about it. Mach number is the is telling you how my input is close to be sonic. So sonic means the velocity is close to the speed of sound. Normally with wind, it is subsonic, namely it is much smaller than the velocity of sound, but still finite. So normally with, with wind, my Mach number will be uh, some, something reasonably small. So this, this is the definition of Mach number. It also appears here. So this gamma is that ratio of heat capacities. And uh, there are two more quantities here in this definition of work. Uh, it appears that I do have an effective entropy production. So the strange thing is that although I've, I'm considering dissipationless flow, uh, still, the final state in homogeneities produce some effective entropy production, which you know is is looking like our expressions from quantum thermodynamics. You presumably um, remind these expressions from as relative entropy. So um, these are normalized final. Rho, rho tilde is, is normalized final density and P tilde is normalized final pressure. And this is the effective entropy production. You see, it appears here and uh, larger sigma is trying to make my work negative and it is harming my work, work extraction. And this is the, the, the usual situation. So I do have here effective entropy production despite of the fact that my liquid is dissipation. Uh, okay, I believe all other quantities are defined. And this is this, this guy, this V, v square is, is just transversal velocity. It, it relates to the fact that here in, in the output, I have also velocities in X and Y directions. So in directions which are not directly related to the work extraction. Okay, so this is the this is the work. I want it to be positive, but there is something more here. I want to extract work first from only kinetic energy, because I know that from from experiments, I know that this seems to be the dominant channel of work ex extraction for wind engines. So I then work ex extraction from kinetic energy means that this this part, which is not related to, to kinetic energy should be put to zero. And if I'm doing that, I get this Carnot type bound for dimensionless work. Now, let me remind from here that if I extract work from kinetic energy only, then this object becomes just the efficiency of work extraction because it is work divided over the inflow of kinetic energy. So, it, it automatically becomes efficiency, and I have the following upper bound from um, for this efficiency of work extraction from, from kinetic energy. Now, uh, instead of temperatures, I have the cross cross sections here, right? So Carnot bound has temperatures. Here I do have temperature as well because my 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 liquid has temperature, but nevertheless. What appears in efficiency is not temperature, but the cross, cross section square. Now, um, what are the similarities with, with Carnot efficiency? Again, entropy production is harming me. This is the first similarity. The second similarity that uh, I do have here some concept of cyclicality in the sense that 
being not cyclic is also going to decrease my efficiency. And then this bound is reached or approached for uh, slow and weakly forced flow. Again, in analogy to the Carnot bound, which is approached in usual thermodynamics by slow processes. So there are uh, there are several uh, there are several analogies with with Carnot efficiency. So besides this this uh, superficially looking Carnot shape, it does have also some physical physical analogies to the to the Carnot efficiency. Okay, so this this picture shows you some numerics, which really tells that uh, in this example you nearly approach the the this this optimal optimal efficiency for the work extraction, and it shows you that uh, pressure and density indeed behave in a, in a cyclic way. So I don't have much time to because only I have only two minutes left. So unfortunately, I cannot explain you in more detail the concept of cyclicity which appears here but you can trust me it is there you have so, more than 15 minutes left actually yes. almost 15 sorry? minutes left. you have almost 15 minutes left excuse me can minutes. you can you can you repeat you have 15 minutes left. 15 minutes oh, yeah oh, oh. i thought i have 35 minutes isn't it no then then, then additional question answer session uh, okay okay yeah. Okay. Okay. I, can, I, can, I can take part from, from questions. Yeah, okay, yeah. but uh, so I don't have to hurry up, but nevertheless, yeah, I have to finish somewhere. So again, the efficiency looks superficially like Carnot, but it's not only superficial. It is also, there are also physical analogies. They, what are those analogies? Entropy is harming. Being not very slow is harming. Being strongly forced is harming. All, the, all these things which are harming the usual Carnot is also, are also harming this, this, um, this efficiency. So, uh, and again, why do I extract work from um, kinetic energy only? Well, this, uh, at this level of our discussion, it can be taken as an experimental fact. It is, it is known from experiments that the dominant mechanism of work extraction for wind engines is, is, is just the kinetic energy, not enthalpy. So in, in principle, I could employ this enthalpic part of work also for work extraction, but within this talk, I will not do that. Okay, so uh, we are not far from, from summarizing everything. Yeah, there is one question from Matthew. Yes, please. I'm new to your Yeah, so you mentioned that uh, because you have no, um, you assume dissipation list turbine, but yet you still get entropy. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on what factors uh, give rise to entry yes. production and okay. the analogy so, between uh, those, of those factors from your yeah. hydrodynamics to thermodynamics. Yeah, okay. So um, let, I, let us see. So <clears throat> this is my control volume. So I assume that the input flow is homogeneous. What does it mean homogeneous? It means that it has pressure, density, and velocity at this end, which are completely independent on space, right? So you have, you have constant uh, mass, mass density, constant um, pressure, constant um, velocity. But uh, due to the work extraction in the final state here, you do not have any more homogeneous flow. Generally, you will have pressure and density which are varying along, along this cross, cross section. And if you then combine carefully everything and define this, this normalized pressure and density for the um, output flow, then it turns out that we, we just uh, work out themselves into this more or less standard expression for the entropy production. So those of you who are doing um, heat engine thermodynamics may recognize this, this, this expression for sigma. It is, it is very much similar to the relative entropy business, which appears also there. So the answer to your question is that I get effective entropy production 
because initially I assumed homogeneous flow, but I could not anymore assume that the output flow is also homogeneous. So is that a result of the geometry changing as a function of position or? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can say so. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, this was the main result, yeah? Carnot efficiency for the work extraction from, uh, for, um, for uh, wind engines. Now I compared it with, uh, with uh, real wind engines. We are normally very much, uh, the efficiency is very much lower than this. But never mind, maybe one day we will get closer to it. Or maybe I should look for curzon arbor type of efficiencies, which are more uh, clever than Carnot in terms of reachability. But uh, this is the summary. So what, what did I do? I tried to explain how to extract work from kinetic energy and how to bound efficiency of that work, work ex extraction. So the bound employs conservation laws. It, there, are, there, are, there are several um, methods by which I prove this, this, this law. So I did hydrodynamics, I did some experimental assumptions, and I did conservations of mass entropy and energy. Now, to, to stress, the conservation of momentum is not here. The conservation of momentum is relevant for understanding whether you can reach the bound, but it doesn't participate directly in the derivation of bound. Okay, uh, now uh, looking from here, from, from this work extraction expression, you may ask yourself, what if you allow also to, to extract some work from enthalpy? Uh, you can also extract from enthalpy, but then it makes uh, efficiency normally smaller. So it is uh, again some some analogy with, with Carnot bound, and then uh, also nothing to say more or less universal comes out if you allow work extraction from ent ent entropy. Now, uh, uh, why there is an effective entropy production? It is because final state is inhom inhomogeneous, and this entropy production has to be sufficiently small, otherwise the bound is not reachable. But uh, you can you can find cases where it is sufficiently small, so you can approach the bound. Um, again, which is more or less similar to the current situation. Now, I I assume that the, the 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 gas which makes my fluid is an ideal gas. This appears to be more or less crucial because I'm still struggling to 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 derive the same bound for non-ideal gases. Ideal gas means the that entropy and internal energy for my flow have to be given by this ideal gas expressions. Uh, yes, not everything is yet clear for non-ideal gases, but I hope it will work out. Okay, so I'm uh, five minutes over of my, so to say, standard time. So let me thank for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Armin. So I should maybe unshare, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so now uh, you can expect some questions. I can see some couple of hand raises. First, Dominic. Dominic, unmute yourself and ask question. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, that was a very nice talk about some uh, real physics, I would say. <laughs> so in quantum thermodynamics, um, very often people focus on on engines working between two thermal bars. So I wonder, because you mentioned quantum physics at some points, uh, but uh, what would be maybe a quantum analog of uh, these wind turbines? I, I, I wonder, could you imagine yeah, some quantum system that would work like this? Yeah, the quantum system is, uh, the, 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 the most obvious analog is a beam of particles which come and scatter on, on an external potential. And uh, these are experiments you are doing with accelerators. Now, uh, with accelerators, you normally don't want to extract work. You are looking for particle production or whatever. But uh, uh, there are nanoscale experiments where people actually try to build quantum windmills. They, they try to do these uh. experiments like putting a beam of particle on, on an external potential and trying to get some work out of it. 
So I hope one day we will also do this type of things in, 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 a, in, in a quantum domain. We will construct quantum windmills, so to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now Jumrak, you can ask. Yeah, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, so maybe I missed it at some point, but uh, does the X directional velocity of uh, this fluid uh, is constant for like every particle in the fluid or are they have some distribution? Because if they are constant, I think maybe it is just yeah. possible to- Initially, yeah, yeah, okay, I see your question. So initially in the input, I assume that every particle has the same velocity. Right. In the output, I have to assume that the X component of every particle is has has the same velocity. So this in, in hydrodynamic jargon, this is called plug flow. And this is type of uh, something which you was more or less verified experimentally in, in, in various situations. Now, uh, I would like very much not to make this, uh, this assumption about the final state. But it turns out to be necessary to get to get anywhere. So the answer to your question that at the input, I assume that it's completely homogeneous in the and I do have a right for that. I once I'm theoretician, I can assume that the input is under, under more my control. But in the output, I don't have any more the, the right to of doing that. Nevertheless, um, picking up from experiments, I make this plug flow assumption which tells that the X component of velocities are the same for all particles, also in the output. So if the input uh, velocity are all homogeneous, can't we just uh, make some force field that uh, make all these input particles stop at the end? Uh, if you, okay, okay. I, I think you are asking a, an interesting question. So you say, can't I extract the whole kinetic energy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then the flow will stop and then uh, and then I will not be able to, to make a stationary work, work extraction, right? So I cannot extract the whole kinetic energy because it will stop the flow. So uh, the, the, the engine will not work anymore. What if it's uh, the force and, make, and, yeah, sorry. No, Imagine, imagine that I extracted the whole kinetic energy. The, mm -hmm. the mass of, of, of air will stop there. So everything will be stuck, right? Then, yeah. then, I, then, I'm, then I'm not, 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 not able to make any device there because the, the, the mass of uh, air will come and stuck there. I will extract once and, and that's it. I will not be able to make continuous work extraction. But you will I have, have to sacrifice something to be to be able to to get to get in uh, in a stationary regime. Mm. Is this clear? But you will have like new airs coming in, right? No, but if I extract the whole kinetic energy, yeah. then then this mass of air will start will stuck. I will I will not be able to get a, a new piece of air there. Ah, uh, so yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, is there any other questions? Uh, okay. May I ask one question? Yeah, Juzer then. Juzer? Yeah, yes. Juzer. Yeah. So, Armin, um, thank you, first of all, for this very interesting talk. And I was a bit intrigued by your Carnot kind of efficiency that you got, mm -hmm. which depends on these cross sectional areas, right? Right. Now, right. Um, normally, Carnot efficiency, the way at least I understand it, uh, is your ratio of your temperatures, and this does not depend on any microscopics of your model or, or your baths or anything, right? But this A1 factor, which is your first cross-sectional area, seems to be something which is a bit arbitrary, or am I missing something here? Okay, uh, uh, so there are, there are two questions here. Let me start with the second question you asked. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is not arbitrary because there are, there are there are reasons to expect that once you give uh, this omega, the shape where your external force is, is localized, right. and once you give the input features of, of, of your flow, then this, this minimal uh, 
control volume B is, is well, de well defined. So um, there are reasons to expect that it's not arbitrary. And also, also in, 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 in certain experiments, whenever we were able to construct this, this control volume, it is, it is not arbitrary. Uh, so this is the, about arbitrariness. Once I'm taking the minimal control volume, then mm -hmm. it is not, not arbitrary. Now, uh, what about uh, the, um, your first question? So let us consider the internal combustion heat engine. Now, um, this internal combustion heat engine, it has two temperatures. One is an atmosphere temperature, right? Mm -hmm. yep. But another one is an inter internal temperature. This, this internal temperature is not a free, per free parameter. It really depends on the functioning of your engine. Various different engines have different internal temperatures. And if your engine is say, not working very well, then it also changes it, it, its internal temperature. So uh, you are right that normally in, in models, we, we assume that temperatures are just independent parameters, yeah. but already this, this combustion engine shows that one of the temperatures can be right a functional parameter of your own model, of, of your own device. So say, if you, if you want to measure the second temperature in the uh, internal combustion engine, you, you, you have to really go inside, put a small thermometer here and determine sure. the, the temperature. You, you don't know it a priori. I see. Yeah? Yeah. So and, and that's the analogy that is happening in your wind engine, it seems, right? Yes, yes. There is, there is some analogy. Yeah. Uh, sorry, if I have a few more minutes, I have another uh, question about the efficiency once again. So yes. uh, it's just my naive assumption probably that uh, at least experimentalists would have some indications of what real efficiencies of these wind engines would be like. Yeah. And yeah how does right. that compare with uh, what we have from this thermodynamic consideration? Yes, so uh, experimentally, say, uh, engineers, um, they do have a, um, an, an engineering bound for this efficiency. It is uh, something famous. It's called uh, Lanchester Betts and then Zhukovsky bound. So of course, once there are wind engines for those many years, engineers would not sit without having bounds. So they do have some, uh, some bounds which I don't find especially consistent. Uh, mm -hmm. I studied these bounds in detail and uh, well, they are, they, are, they are not completely consistent. So the bound is telling that the, the efficiency is bound by this 16 over 27, six, which is by, the, by, this, by this specific number, which doesn't depend on, on anything. So uh, this is the engineering bound, but I didn't see any, any way to understand it theoretically because Theory which we are doing is contradictory for, for this at least two reasons I, I mentioned. So uh, yes, engineers normally operate with this bound, 16 over 26, 27. But uh, one of my own results is that I couldn't find any way to, to, to derive it um, theoretically. I see. And, uh... Just curious about another thing because you started with the Euler equations, right? And uh, wouldn't I, if I'm thinking of a more general situation, uh, wouldn't the Navier-Stokes equations be something more uh, reasonable for these fluid flows? And oh, certainly, do you certainly. Have, do sure, you sure, have any course. idea how yeah. one would actually adapt this thing to the Navier-Stokes? Maybe it's a long question, but I mean, yeah. No. Uh, uh, yeah. Well. well so. um, there are there are two two issues here. One is uh, just writing down Navier stocks and applying uh, conservation laws. They are not anymore conservation laws, but what what substitutes conservation laws. And another one is the, is the definition of control volume. So uh, so far I didn't do that, but uh, you are right that it should be both interesting and, and relevant because these cause effects are are certainly important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Let us thank the speaker once again and have a
Okay. Uh, I should, uh, was there an intention for the recognition? 